Hey guys, this is Warhawk Beyond 2040, and welcome to the final edition of the Crisis on Infinite Earths review series. And today I'm going to be talking about Legends of Tomorrow, Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 5. Now, although this part is credited as Legends of Tomorrow, this technically isn't the first episode of Season 5. This part acts as more of a TV special, so to speak. So the next time I will be talking about Episode 1 of Legends will be in the Season 5 review series, which I've uploaded the intro for just a few weeks ago. So make sure you don't miss that. So let's talk about what's happened so far. At the end of Part 4 of The Crisis, which was Episode 8 of Arrow, we saw the Paragons stranded in the Vanishing Points, and we saw Oliver take on his role as the Spectre and guiding them through the Speed Force. So we saw a number of callbacks to the Arrow series involving Barry Allen and Sarah Lance. So that was a lot of fun to see. We were also treated to a cameo from Ezra Miller as the DC Extended Universe version of The Flash. And we saw him and the Arrowverse Flash interact with each other in a true meeting of Flash of Two Earths. So that was a lot of fun. We also learned more about Marnavu's backstory. And we got to see what's happened to his wife and his family. So that was probably one of the best things I liked about Part 4 of The Crisis. We finally got to learn more about the Monitor's background and how the Anti-Monitor was created so that was a very cool scene and I thought that was a great way to open part 4 of the crisis in my opinion. We also saw Oliver make the ultimate sacrifice by not only destroying the anti-monitor but also saving the entire multiverse while creating a new earth at the same time. So I thought that was a great way to end part 4 of the crisis. And in my opinion, Oliver's sacrifice the second time round was a lot more emotional than the first one. Not saying that the first one wasn't, but that was more of a shocking moment than an emotional one. Because this time round, you got the sense that, right, this is it now. Stephen Amell's finally done here. So this was a great way to give Stephen Amell the ultimate send-off for everything that he's done, not just for the show, but for Arrowverse shows overall. So this was a lot of fun. So with that all said, let's talk about Legends of Tomorrow, Crisis on Infinite Earths, Part 5. So we kick off Part 5 with Kara Danvers waking up in her apartment after seeing various memories of herself fighting in the crisis flash before her very eyes. And it appears that she's fallen asleep on her couch. I thought this was quite an interesting way to start off the fifth and final part of the crossover events. It almost feels like all the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths felt like one big humongous dream. So the way they played it out in this scene was just quite interesting. It's not really the way I would have expected it to kick off really. But I thought it was a good start nonetheless. So we see Alex is there and she talks about how she's finally up. Startled, Kara ends up inadvertently using her heat vision on the wall near her fridge. And she asks Kara if she had a bad dream. Kara answers that she doesn't really know. Kara then asks her sister, how did she get there? And Alex says that you fell asleep in front of the TV. So Oliver's sacrifice has basically just rebooted the entire multiverse so to speak so any of the memories that the others had all gone and only the paragons who are part of the crisis remember everything that's happened so this was a really cool way to do things like that so this is the official start of the whole earth prime rebirth sort of universe so Alex confesses that Kara looked very peaceful and that she didn't have the heart to move her to the bed. Kara then goes on to repeat the dawn of time 
several times, which makes Alex wonder if that was what she was watching before she nodded off. Kara pulls the curtains and says, this doesn't feel right. A worried Alex mentions how the white Martian really did a number on her last night. She asks Kara once again if she's sure she's fine. Kara says, I am fine. Before she leaves, Kara tells Alex she loves her and Alex says, I love you too. Kara then gets a call from Nia saying she has to be at the ceremony for the 2020 Nobel Prize Peace Award, which is about to begin. Nia tells Kara not to worry, though, that she saved her a seat, but a lady from the Gazette is giving her angry eyes. Oh boy, here it comes. Nia warns her friend that if Kara misses this, Andrea is going to blow a gasket, and in a blink of an eye, Kara manages to get there at super speed. Nia laughs, telling Kara that she has very good timing. She tells Nia that she had a really weird dream about last night and was wondering if she could help her interpret it about what exactly has happened. Kara goes to explain to Nia that she thinks she dreamt of the world ending, but it wasn't just one world, it was all of the worlds, not just theirs. Nia laughs it off saying, well that's very dramatic even for us. Everyone aside from Kara stands up to clap when it's announced that none other than Lex Luthor is the winner of the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize Award. Oh dear. Can you imagine just waking up and the first thing you see is Lex Luthor is being presented with a Nobel Peace Award? Yeah, that would really <laughs> feel like an absolute nightmare. Kara asks if she's still dreaming, to which an oblivious near says she's really glad this award is going to someone who truly deserves it. And that's when you know something is truly wrong. Lex winks at Kara before starting his speech by saying that we live in dangerous times. Earth is a dangerous place. I suppose that's why people love superheroes so much. The power of someone who can fly faster than a speeding bullet. Lex then goes on to say that getting this award is so special to him because he doesn't have any superpowers of his own. He reiterates that he can't leap tall buildings in a single bound, but also goes on to say that he has dedicated his entire life to fighting on the side of humanity. He also says that to be recognised for that is more than he can ever put into words. So he finishes his speech by saying that he stands with mankind. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we all know better, don't we? Yeah, something's definitely not right here. Shortly after, we see Kara in her Supergirl identity at the DEO, still trying to make sense of everything that's happened as she is re-watching the speech from Lex Luthor. She mentions how she's still disoriented. Alex tells her sister how everybody just keeps throwing awards at Lex, but he never accepts them in person. However, this one in particular meant a lot to him. Kara still can't believe what she's hearing and wonders how people can think he's a good guy. See? Not the only ones who think something's not right. And Alex says that Lex Luthor is not only a good guy, he's the best guy. Frustrated, Kara tells her sister that he's not a good guy. In fact, he's a psychopathic lunatic. Alex then reveals to Kara that Lex Luthor is their boss now. He's in charge of the DEO. Oh, God. <laughs> Just when it couldn't get any more worse. And his number one supporter, besides Lena, of course. Alex tells Kara about all the times the two Luthers defended her to the president. Jean Jones then comes to Kara as she begins to freak out and reveals that they're the only ones that remember the changes after the crisis because they're the Paragons. Jean suspects the first of many changes will reveal themselves in time. An alarm bleeps and Alex says that something appears to be going on downtown. She says she will send a team there. Kara says that won't be necessary. I need to punch something and she hits a wall and leaves. I think the whole idea of all of the Paragons, like Batwoman, Jean Jones, The Flash, Supergirl, all those guys who are part of the crisis are the only ones who remember everything before. Makes for a very interesting dynamic as we go forward with all of the Arrowverse shows. So this is just the beginning of all of the different changes that Oliver's sacrifice helped create in this new universe. So it's going to be very interesting to see 
how everything will unfold here, but Lex Luthor being the DEO and in charge of it makes for a very interesting dynamic. So that's going to be a lot of fun to see over the course of Season 5 of Supergirl. We're then taken to downtown National City at the docks where we see the Flash villain, Weather Witch, is causing havoc with her staff that's spewing electricity from it. Now this is the first time that Supergirl and the Weather Witch have actually clashed with each other because the two of them originally, before the crisis, were on two separate Earths. So to see Supergirl tangling with one of the Flash's enemies is quite interesting. Then after that we see some police cars arrive at the scene but just as she hits the two police cars with electricity, Supergirl shows up, Weather Witch looks behind her and smirks saying, look who finally decided to join the fun. Kara asks who she is and Weather Witch introduces herself and tells the Kryptonian that she is no match for her as she begins to create a funnel cloud with her staff. Barry Allen in his Flash costume arrives not too long after, throwing Weather Witch into the air apologising by saying that she's one of his and initially wondering what each other is doing on their earth. Then they both realise that they seem to be on a composite of their earths. After having stopped the metahuman, an old man approaches them and it's none other than Crisis on Infinite Earths writer himself, Marv Wolfman. For many of you who are very familiar with the name, Marv Wolfman was the writer for the graphic novel of Crisis on Infinite Earths and played a big part in the writing of having Supergirl and The Flash killed off in that graphic novel. So to actually see the man himself make a cameo in the final part of the crossover event was a real coup and I hope it's not the last time that we see Marv Wolfman in the Arrowverse. Maybe he could be the Arrowverse's answer to Stan Lee, just have him randomly pop up every so often in random different scenes. I think that would be really, really cool, in my opinion. The old man gets closer to Flash and Supergirl and tells the two heroes that he loves it when he sees them two working together. The old man also asks the two of them for their respective autographs. Kara and Barry use this opportunity to gather intel and ask him if it's normal to see the two of them working together to take down bad guys, like today for example. The old man reveals that normally they always have the green arrow and a legend or two to help them out. He continues on by saying that just last year even Batman joined him. He then tells Barry to make it out to Marv reveals that all of the heroes have been working together since forever, confirming to them what has happened. You know, as I said, you know, having Marv Wolfman be the one to like, kind of break the fourth wall with all of the heroes from the Arrowverse have been working together since like forever was, I think, a real nice coup. So, in a way, having him there confirms that all of the Earths have been fused together as one single world. So. I think that was a really good way to like bring everything together and who better than the man who helped write quite possibly the biggest events in the history of DC Comics. So mega props to the CW for bagging this potential one-off cameo. Shortly after we are taken to Central City's underground tunnels where two workers have found an unconscious Nash Wells. Now this is the first time we have seen Nash Wells since his actions as the pariah which led to the Anti-Monitor being released. So this is now the first time officially we are seeing him back to normal after Oliver's sacrifice at the end of part 4 of the crisis. One of the workers checks for a pulse and tells the other to call for help. He flashes a light where Nash is laying nearby and all we see is a cement wall where the anti-monitor was kept hidden for all those years. You know, I wondered when we would see Nash Wells again. Obviously, uh, his actions as the pariah were highly questionable, but at the same time, he did in a way kind of help all of the Paragons, so this should be quite interesting what kind of role Nash Wells will play now, now that he's no longer the pariah. Meanwhile in Star City we see Sarah Lance walking around the streets and this is also the first time we have seen her since Oliver's sacrifice that led to the birth of the new Earth. 
Sarah is a bit disoriented and wonders how she got back there. She gets a headache as she recalls certain moments she lived through during the anti-monitor crisis. Sarah almost ends up getting hit by a car and with the cars honking at her in the middle of the road, she reaches for her phone and calls Ray Palmer asking him where he is. She ends up at the bar where Ray calls her and she hugs him upon seeing him again. Ray looks confused asking Sarah if she's okay. Sarah asks Ray what is the last thing he remembers and he's a bit perplexed to have Sarah asking him if he doesn't remember coming to this very same bar for trivia night which was what we saw at the beginning of part one of the crisis event and then getting magically transported to an alternate wave rider. She then goes on to tell him that they were called to help stop the multiverse from getting destroyed. Ray then asks Sarah if there was a crossover if they and if they actually won. <laughs> it's quite funny and sometimes a bit annoying when they keep doing things like that. But I do find it a bit funny every time the Legends reference the crossover events. Like, for example, I can't remember what it was. might have been Elseworlds, where um, Ray said, Oh, um, looks like we're not getting invited to the annual crossover event again. So that one was quite funny. So I like it when they once in a while do things like that, breaking the fourth wall. We then see Jean Jones show up at the bar and his eyes flash red as he uses his telepathic powers to communicate with the two legends. Jean admits that it's good to see the two of them are safe. Sarah asks Ray how he knew Jean from Supergirl's Earth, but Ray is confused that the idea is Supergirl has her own Earth. Jean reveals that this is not the case anymore because when they restarted the, the multiverse, their worlds combined and only the Paragons have any knowledge of the previous events. Jean then tells Sarah that he has been going around from city to city restoring the memories of their compatriots. Sarah asks him about Oliver but Jean reveals that there hasn't been any sign of him. She, she leaves Jean and Ray behind and goes in search of Oliver. We then see Sarah arrive at the Arrow Cave and Sarah calls out for Oliver multiple times but finds no sign of him. Sarah then notices that Oliver's green arrow suit is missing from the cases and finds Diggle, Renee and Dinah looking rather sad. They reveal to her that they know everything that's happened because Jean Jones had previously restored their memories and gave them a splitting headache in the process. Diggle cries saying how Oliver died twice and that he wasn't there for either of them and that he felt that he's failed him both times. John tearfully says how Oliver was his brother, to which Sarah nods and says very tearfully, I know. Sarah says that they all died, that the entire multiverse perished, but now everyone is back, so there's a chance Oliver could still be alive as well. Renee explains that after their brain dump, they had Felicity run a global search for Oliver, but found nothing. Sarah and John hug after, realising that Oliver actually is really gone. The only thing I'm a bit bummed out about this is just I would have liked to have seen Diggle, Dinah and Renee have a much bigger role in the crisis. Especially Diggle because I really thought that Diggle was going to be there from the beginning to the very end and possibly become the Green Lantern but I don't know why they didn't give him a bigger role. I mean I would have loved to have seen him in the thick of things fighting alongside all of the Arrowverse heroes. I mean, he's been there since the beginning, so it just would have made more sense to have Diggle there more than anyone else. No disrespect to Dinah and Renee, but as I said, Diggle has been through everything since the Arrowverse started, really. So it is a real shame, but it is what it is. And this is also the first time that Felicity's actually been mentioned since all the Earths have been merged together, so... Nice little shout out to Felicity Smoke in the final part of the crisis. Meanwhile, back at Star Labs, Caitlin is using a device to scan the still unconscious Nash Wells, who is now laying on a bed in the medical bay. Caitlin notices Jean Jones is standing there and asks him if something is wrong. Jean very angrily says, not anymore, no thanks to him, as he looks in Nash's direction. She asks him if he knows why Nash is in the state he's in, and Jean Joan proceeds to do a brain dump of all the memories from before the anti wave matter hit and destroyed Earth One. Jean tells Caitlin that Nash has paid a very heavy price for his misjudgment, but not as much as some of the others. 
Jean yells at Nash and damns him to hell for all of the damage he's done and the parts he's played in as the pariah during the crisis event. Nash then gets all his memories back and apologises profusely for the parts he played in during the crisis event. I'm wondering if whether or not we'll see Nash Wells on some sort of redemption arc for the parts he played during his state as the pariah because he didn't intentionally mean to unleash the anti-monitor but you know some people are not going to see it that way so I hope they do some sort of redemption arc for him in the Flash series because you know I don't think Nash Wells is a bad person he's just a little bit misguided in my opinion meanwhile back at Star City Barry and Kara arrive at the Arrow Cave wanting to double check that her Earth had merged with theirs. Kara tells Sarah, Diggle and the others that National City along with Katko, the DEO and even Argo City are now all part of this new Earth. Sarah and John then break the news to Barry and Kara that Oliver didn't make it. Kara wonders why Oliver gave everyone else a fresh start but not himself. John Diggle thinks that maybe the only way he could do it was if he sacrificed his an alarm beeps and when the others ask who's attacking John says they wouldn't believe him if he told them and it's none other than yeah you guessed it a giant Bebo yeah you know I didn't mind it when they did the giant Bebo back at the end of season 3 of Legends of Tomorrow I thought, you know, that was a fun one-off sort of deal, but yeah, this is kind of a low point in the Crisis crossover events. Not that there have been that many, but if I had to choose just one low point moment of this entire crossover event, it would probably be the giant Bebo attacking Star City because it just doesn't fit the tone of everything else that's come before I mean I know you gotta have some light moments and you gotta have a bit of a laugh but this was not one of them <laughs> I'm sorry I, I didn't like this I thought this was really stupid and you know we kind of saw this already back at the end of season 3 of Legends of Tomorrow and I believe during the second half of Legends of Tomorrow season 3 as well but yeah I, I didn't like this at all I just thought this was very very pointless and just kind of felt like a, a filler compared to the other four parts in my opinion you know when you go from the anti-monitor to this yeah it's a bit of a downgrade in my opinion meanwhile back on the wave rider Sarah Lance contacts Ava and Nate who are aboard asking them if they know anything about why a giant Bebo is running around the streets of Star City they ask Sarah if she needs their help, but she tells them to stay in Washington, D.C. She goes on to say that she doesn't want any more of her people getting roped into this mess. Ava and Nate reveal that Mick is already in Star City doing a book signing. The Atom, The Flash and Supergirl team up and Mick also shows up to help stop Bebo. Yeah, try saying that with a straight face. And Batwoman also shows up and Supergirl goes completely fangirl all over the fact that Batwoman is actually on the same Earth as well. Isn't it funny that on Supergirl's own show, she's all super serious, no pun intended, but during these crossovers she's like a little fangirl. I don't know if that's just me or has anybody else noticed that, but it's kind of funny. It's like Supergirl in her own show and Supergirl and the crossovers it's like they're two completely different characters I don't know maybe it's just me but I've just noticed that over the last couple crossovers that I've seen with Supergirl Kara and Barry aren't sure what to do having never encountered a giant bumbling children's toy so they let Sarah take the lead Sarah immediately shifts into captain mode giving Barry, Kara and Ray their orders which they don't hesitate to take they try to trip Bebo up and he wibbles and he wobbles but he won't fall down. Batwoman also drops in and gives him an extra hand as well. They all realise that Bebo is just merely a distraction. The Flash and White Canary show up at a bank where a robber is stealing money and they manage to defeat him. Meanwhile, the rest of the heroes manage to stop Bebo from terrorising Star City 
and Ray decides to take this opportunity to take a selfie of himself and all of the heroes defeating the giant walking Bebo. Oh, God. <laughs> you know what, if I had to fight something like that, I'd probably be very pissed at the fact that one of my teammates is taking selfies while we're trying to save the world. Yeah, you can look at Barry and Kara's faces there. They're not exactly thrilled about it. I mean, it is a funny moment, but at the same time, it's a little bit annoying and very cringy at times. Nash Wells then shows up at the Arrow Cave to warn everyone that there's a massive surge of antimatter in Star City, and he thinks that this is just the beginning, and that their fights with the Anti-Monitor is going to start all over again. Well, that's a welcome upgrade from fighting a giant Bebo, in my opinion. Barry and Sarah then talk about Oliver, who is at the last tether of her old life, and that he was the only person that was left who knew her as herself. But now that he's gone, she feels as though she's out of place in this new world. Barry comforts her by saying that he knows what it's like to lose family, and how it feels like life will not be the same. He goes on to say that this is true. Family isn't just the people you grew up with, but the people you find along the way. This was actually a really nice scene, and you know, it makes a nice change from all the wackiness and silliness that is Legends of Tomorrow. So, this was definitely a much needed scene, and you know, we haven't really got much interaction with Barry and Sarah. I mean, they've had a few scenes over the course of the Arrow versus Run, but this was actually a really nice scene, and I felt we needed this, you know, after Oliver sacrificed himself back in past four so you know this was definitely a nice welcome follow-up to the end of part four of the crisis sarah confesses that the legends are her family and they have been for a while but she always thought that at least one person that knew what she was like before she got on the gambit boat was oliver they are then attacked by the shadow demons and are telepathically told by jean that the paragons are all being hunted down Sarah realises that Ryan Choi is also in danger and goes to rescue him. Oh yeah, I forgot about him. <laughs> we haven't seen him yet, have we? She gets there after Ryan has been running around with his baby, <laughs> trying desperately to keep them safe from the shadow demons. Yep, he's a hero and a father, in that order. I love it. When he's rescued by Sarah, he is taken to the Arrow Cave, where they all deduce that the Anti-Monitor is still alive and that Oliver's sacrifice didn't kill him at all. Ryan and Ray realise that while they can't destroy or kill the Anti-Monitor because he's made of antimatter, they can destabilise his form and have him shrinking for eternity. Clever. A horde of shadow demons begin to attack their way to Star City. Dinah stays behind on the comms while the other heroes gather to fight the army of shadow demons. Alex sees John Jones in his new suit, to which he replies, It's a new world. The Anti-Monitor then shows up using the Shadow Demons and tells the heroes gathered that it's time to meet their end. All the way from the Arrow Cave, Dinah contacts Nash, Ray and... Meanwhile, back at Star Labs, Ryan mentions that they will need a reinforced core to contain the chemical reaction properly. Ray suggests titanium, but Nash says it would be too heavy. Instead, he comes across depleted Prometheum. Meanwhile, at Star City... Dinah warns Frost and Heatwave that they have a horde of shadow demons coming their way. As they're walking, Mick says it's been a while and that she looks great. Frost thanks him and says she read his book and proceeds to call him Rebecca, Mick's pen name. When a shadow demon shows up, Frost asks Heatwave if he wants to take it. Rory says, ladies first, to which Frost replies, age before beauty. Ultimately, the Shadow Demons are taken care of when Black Lightning shows up out of nowhere to help them. Yeah! My man, Black Lightning. I'm glad to see he's back. We haven't seen him since... Oh, part three of the crisis. Oh my god. So yeah, it's great to see him back in action, fighting alongside these guys. I missed him. Great to have you back, Black Lightning. Meanwhile, back in Star City, the Anti-Monitor has made himself very, very tall. Oh, look, everyone, it's Apocalypse. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The Anti-Monitor tells the heroes that they are nothing but insects fated to be crushed by his heel. He goes on to tell them that fighting is useless and asks them to surrender. White Canary says, not today and not ever. 
She then tells the anti-monitor that Oliver died so they could keep fighting. She continues by saying that Oliver sacrificed everything for this new world and they will not fail him. And all of them at once, in a very epic moment, they all say, for Oliver. Yeah, this was a really great moment. All of the heroes of the Arrowverse standing side by side in honour of Oliver Queen as they head into battle. This was an epic moment. I absolutely love this. As the heroes charge into battle, the Anti-Monitor then makes himself grow to an unprecedented height and he yells out that the Age of Heroes ends now. John Jones in his Martian Manhunter form, along with Supergirl and Superman, all launch attacks from the sky at the giant version of the Anti-Monitor, trying to buy Ryan, Ray and Nash some time with building the bomb that would help to take care of the Anti-Monitor. Meanwhile, back at Star Labs, Black Lightning, Heatwave and Frost continue to fight off the Shadow Demons with Heatwave calling Black Lightning Sparkles after asking where he's from. Black Lightning reveals that it's been a very weird day after Martian Manhunter came to see him in Freeland and gave him all his memories of the multiverse back. Using his super speed, Flash goes back to Central City and assembles the bomb. Nash tells him that's now all they need to do is get it to indirect contact with the Anti-Monitor once they've activated it. The Flash then speeds back to Star City and takes Ray with him to help out in the final battle with the Anti-Monitor. Yeah, this has been really good so far. Probably not as strong as the other parts, but this has still been a lot of fun. The Atom arrives just in time and saves Superman from being crushed and gives the bomb to Supergirl, telling her to throw it like a girl. Supergirl throws it and it makes contact with the Anti-Monitor. Kara then asks where is Superman and he tells his cousin he's right there, just tiny because the Atom shrunk him in order to help him escape the tight grip that the Anti-Monitor had him in. Yeah, this is a, a very unusual way of defeating a villain as we see the Anti-Monitor get smaller and smaller and smaller until he's eventually the size of, no pun intended, an Atom. You know, I was expecting more of an epic finale or an epic ending to the defeat of the Anti-Monitor. I mean, they built him up as like the ultimate threat and he just gets shrunk. You know, I just would have expected a lot more, you know, especially with it being the final part of the crisis. But, you know, as we always say, it is what it is, but I would have preferred a much more fitting end for someone as big as the anti-monitor but oh well never mind but it was still a cool moment to see all the heroes fighting side by side and trying to take down this huge giant down but i just would have expected something a little bit more but nonetheless it was still a lot of fun we're then taken to the white house in washington dc where the president is giving a speech where she tells everyone in this televised speech that their way of life and their world almost came to an end. She reveals that an entity known as the Anti-Monitor attacked Earth and this was stopped thanks to Oliver Queen, also known as the Green Arrow. We then see John, Diggle and Lila Michaels, who is now no longer the Harbinger, watching the news with JJ in a nearby table. And we also are treated to seeing an older version of Sarah Diggle, who comes from behind and hugs her dad. Meanwhile, Clark is flying around at night when he gets a call from Lois, who tells him that he needs to get to Metropolis to take care of his sons. The President then asks everyone to join her in a moment of silence to honour Oliver's sacrifice. Unbeknownst to everyone, Oliver's voice is heard talking about the new beginning of this multiverse, and a new Earth 2 is shown to be the home of Stargirl and the Justice Society of America. We then see a new version of Earth 12, which shows the Green Lantern cause. Yeah, so this is our first official hint at the Green Lanterns in the Arrowverse. So you never know. You just never know. And we also see a new version of Earth-19 where it is inhabited by Swamp Thing. Also, we see a new version of Earth-9, home of the Titans. We also see Earth-21, which is now the home of the Doom Patrol. And then last but not least, we are treated to Earth-96 where we see Superman flying in space back in his original iconic costume and flying off in classic Christopher Reeve style. Yeah, this was nice, you know, this I thought if this is going to be the last time that we see Brandon Roth as Superman then I'm really glad we got to see him in the Superman suit one final time and 
nice homage to the late great Christopher Reeve. We then see a shot of Oliver Queen's Green Arrow suit hanging up in a full display case as we see Martian Manhunter, Batwoman, White Canary, The Flash, Black Lightning, Supergirl and Superman all gathered around looking at it with a US flag hanging over it. Kara thanks Oliver and says that the world has hope again and that she does too. She promises that they will never forget him. Barry moves up front. He then thanks Oliver for believing in him when he didn't believe in himself that he just had this way about him that brought the best in all of them. So in a way this is kind of like the Arrowverse's take on Funeral for a Friend, similar to what they did for Superman back in the graphic novel in the early 90s. Barry also says that he will miss Oliver. Sarah says that she has lost a lot of people that she loves but that she never imagined her life without him in it. She says he was always there for her and that he changed her fate for the better. Kara then uses her heat vision to light a fire being contained as an arrowhead shaped container. Jefferson tells Barry that although he didn't know or meet Oliver, he must have been a really good dude. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen Black Lights and meet Green Arrow at least just one time. Shame we never got a crossover with them two. I think it would have been really good. Jefferson then asks Barry why he brought all of them to a condemned building. This is now officially known as Earth Prime. Barry says this isn't a condemned building, not at all, but an old Star Labs research facility that nobody uses. He mentions that what's even better is the fact that nobody actually knows this exists. This is good for them in the long run. He tells the other heroes that he figured that they could all use this place to gather if anything ever happens again. Superman tells Barry that it's a great idea. Martian Manhunter agrees that, well, it's better than all of you dropping in the DEO, especially now with Lex Luthor running things. Jefferson asks, why do they even need it? How often does the world even come to an end? They all pull faces and Kate says, oh, don't worry about it. I was like you last year. I was a new kid. A very giddy, excited Barry tells the other heroes that he hasn't shown them the best part. He pulls off a cloth to reveal that a large table with all of the heroes' crests on everyone's respective chairs. Very justice I like it. Each of the chairs has their own respective symbol. Empty eighth chair is left to honour Oliver's memory that has an arrowhead on it. The seven heroes all smile at each other once they have sat down. Yep, the Arrow vs Justice League is officially born. But then he hears some screeching noises above the ceiling. And Sarah says, look like they've got pest control. And they see a the final shot of a cage that's labelled Gleek as we hear the iconic Super Friends theme being played. And we get a quick shot of the Hall of Justice from the outside. And there you have it guys, that wraps it up for the Crisis on Infinite Earth review series. Hope you enjoyed listening to this as much as I've enjoyed reviewing it. And I would have to say part 5, a little bit weak at times but I wouldn't say it was terrible, but I don't think it was as strong as the other four parts. But there was some cool moments, and to finally see all of the heroes come together to form some sort of Justice League. I mean, we don't know what they're going to be called. I can't imagine they're going to be called the Justice League for obvious reasons. So maybe they might go by the name Super Friends, which sounds a little bit corny, but it kind of makes sense at this point. So, I'm going to wrap this up now, and I'm going to drop this here for you guys. What did you think of Part 5 of Crisis on Infinite Earths? Did you think it was as good as the other four parts? Did you have any favourite moments? Was there anything you didn't like? You know what to do guys, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, Leave your thoughts and comments down below. And the next time I will be back, I'll be kicking off the Season 5 review series of Legends of Tomorrow. And I'll also be reviewing the rest of the other shows for the Arrowverse. So till then, take care everybody. And don't miss the bonus video that I'll be dropping near the end of the week. Where I'll be counting down my top 10 favourite moments of all five parts of the Crisis crossover events. So don't miss that. So till then, take care everybody and stay safe.